And you can turn to Luke chapter 1 and 2, and then also Matthew 1 and 2. Just we'll be jumping around. Uh, I, I sort of love about the Gospels. There's a number of different accounts of the life of Jesus and even the birth of Jesus. So we'll be, um, it's nice to be able to combine uh, each account, and then we get quite a narrative here of what really went on uh, at the very first Christmas. So we're looking at things are looking up. Now, what is your reaction when you read that? Maybe you saw it on the sign coming in. I always wonder when we put up, you know, the name of the sermon or whatever we're doing, if people driving by, if they, if they really even read it or if they, it causes them to think or it causes them to say, hey, I want to go to that church. <laughs> Probably not. I mean, come on. It, it takes a lot to, uh, you know, get people here. But um, what, what you, is your reaction when, you know, you... Some of you are tracking with that because that's the kind of way you are. You just, yeah, things are looking up. Others, you're like, what planet are you living on, Pastor Mike? You look around you. I, I mean, look around at what's happening in our world. It, really, things are looking up. And that's really the point of the whole message here this morning is this. That's part of the problem because oftentimes we find ourselves looking around. We're looking at our circumstances. We're looking at things that people do, we even focus on what we feel in a particular moment, which is very unreliable, instead of looking up. And I want to suggest to you today on this Christmas Sunday that things will start looking up when you start looking up, when I start looking up. Now, some of you are like, well, come on, can that really be true? Isn't that just... You know, not just a bunch of positive thinking, mental gymnastics. Come on, really. Well, I think we're going to learn from this cast of Christmas characters that we're going to look at this morning that how true that really is, that when you begin to look up, when you begin to take your eyes off everything that you're going on and going around you, when you start looking up, when you, things will start looking up when you start looking up. Now, about 700 years before the very first Christmas, 700 years before it ever happened, Isaiah, a prophet of God, God spoke to him about Jesus, God sending his son Jesus to come to the earth. That's what I love about uh, the reliability of the scriptures. This happened 700 years. Somebody wrote it down 700 years before it happened, and it happened. So many prophecies have been fulfilled. There's a, a number of them that are still yet to be filled. We can rely on God's word. And 700 years before it happened, Isaiah prophesied, proclaimed, declared that God was going to send his son. And his son would be both great and powerful and yet still tender and um, personal. Look what Isaiah said in Isaiah 40. He says, shout it from the mountaintops. Go tell it on the mountain. All right? That's where we get that from. Shout it from the mountaintops, your God is coming, so look up. There it is, look up. That phrase, look up, or lift your eyes, is used throughout Scripture. And here, Isaiah is saying, look up, because you don't want to miss what's coming. This Savior that's coming, he gives strength to those who are tired and worn out. Anybody tired and worn out? You need some strength. Even young people, even a Luke Yoder, <laughs> big strapping young man who's single. <clears throat> but not allowed to mingle. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, sorry. Um, these folks might be tuning in. Um, anyways. But, you know, even even young people, even, even students, and some students are so tired and worn out of doing school online, doing school at home. Parents, you're like so tired of the whole thing. We all want to get back to normal. So even young people become exhausted and want to give up. But those who put their hope in their feelings, no. Those who put their hope in their surroundings, in the conditions, no. Those who put their hope in the Lord, will find new strength. They will fly high on wings like eagles. Oh, we love this verse, don't we? We quote it often. They will run and not grow weary. They will keep on walking without fainting. Now, that's right where we left off last Sunday, those of you who remember. We talked about being in God's waiting room. Hey, when you're in any waiting room, it's not fun. 
You want to get to see the doctor. You need some pain medication. You need it now. And it's just you're waiting and you're waiting. When you're in God's waiting room, guess what? That's frustrating too. When you've prayed about something, you're expecting an answer. You're hoping for an answer. You're, you're waiting for this. You're waiting for that. God's waiting room is not an easy place to be in. And we talked last week that when you're in the waiting room, you should fear not, fret not, forget not, and faint not. Now, a couple of these are some older English King James Version kind of words that we don't, we don't use a whole lot anymore, fret not and faint not. The biblical, uh, the, the language for faint not is not what we would think when you just kind of fall over and faint. This is a spiritual application here, and uh, that word means to, to give up. When, when you faint, you're, you're giving up. Maybe you're wilting on the inside. You're, you're, you know, fainting or quitting. And as we look at kind of the world in which we live these days, I, I don't know what issues you're facing at this Christmas season. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what kind of burdens you're carrying. I don't know what um, struggles you're, you're, you're having to deal with. I don't know what kind of feelings of you know, anxiousness or uh, confusion uh, that, that you're having to deal with. I don't know what those are, but I do know. And my encouragement to you is don't give up. Look up. Don't give up. Look up. Now, it's easy to say that, and it's hard to do. Um, but as we look at this cast of Christmas characters, every single one of them were overwhelmed by the situation that they were in, and they all wanted to give up. See, we have this romanticized picture, this idealistic view of what it was like on that very first Christmas. Oh, it was, everybody was, it was stress-free. It was just a silent night. Oh, my goodness, when you really dig into the details of this, it was not it was a stressful, chaotic scene all the way to the events leading up to that very first Christmas. Uh, and so let's take a quick look at maybe what some of these characters might have felt like. How about Mary? Let's start with Mary. Mary, um, you know, how did she react initially to this news that she was going to be carrying God's son? Now, we've been talking a little bit about Mary, Joseph, and all the characters for the last couple of weeks, but... Um, how did she initially react? Well, she didn't react very well. I mean, she, uh, it, it was, I mean, how would you react if an angel showed up to you and told you that you were going to be pregnant, but you have not had any relations with a man? I mean, can you imagine? She had thousands of questions like, what? You know, why me? How is this going to happen? Um, I mean, think about it. It'd be hard for you to believe that story if somebody told you. And so she had lots of questions. It was a, you know, what, what is she supposed to, what am I supposed to tell my fiancé? What am I supposed to tell my parents? <laughs> what am I, I going to say to my friends? She was filled with a lot of questions. In fact, she was confused and worried. And if an angel showed up to you and told you that, you'd be confused and worried too. So her reaction was actually quite normal. In fact, look what the text says in Luke chapter 1, verse 29. There it says it, confused and d disturbed. And that Greek verb actually, it's like uh, totally, completely shaken, disturbed, deeply disturbed. Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. So Mary was confused and she was worried. She was not having a very merry Christmas. How about Joseph? How did Joseph initially react to the news? I mean, Mary tried to explain that, you know, she's pregnant. And uh, Joseph knew that it, he wasn't the dad because he, they did not have relations. He knew that. So it, imagine what Joseph felt. Joseph felt hurt and disillusioned. He probably felt betrayed. He felt maybe like he was being lied to. And any explanation that he could give would not satisfy all the people around him. So he was hurt. He was disillusioned. He had this plan of marrying this girl, you know, them raising a family, starting a little carpenter business, and just kind of going on through life. And all of that was turned upside down. So he was dis uh, disillusioned with his life. In fact, look what it says. Joseph, he was a good man. 
And he didn't want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. He wanted to, he wanted to send her out, send her off, you know, hey, I'll move out of town and I'll start my little life over here. You do your life over here. Let's just do this quietly. I don't want to disgrace you. I'm already embarrassed and, you know, I can't explain it away. So let's just start all over. He wanted out. He wanted to quit. He wanted to give up. That's how he reacted. So he wasn't having a very Merry Christmas either. How about the shepherds? Well, the shepherds, they were scared to death. They, in fact, here's why. <laughs> they were, you know, watching their sheep at night, and suddenly an angel, one angel, an angel of the Lord surrounded. How does one angel surround? It must have been amazing sight. And it says they were terrified. So they were, they were frightened. They were were terrified. They were probably looking for a place to hide. They were probably looking for an outhouse, to be to true, honest with you. I mean, they were freaking out. So they weren't having a very Merry Christmas either, were they? And how about the wise guys, the wise men? All right, what about those guys? You know, they're the kind of the last piece in, in, this, uh, in this puzzle here. Well, they were exhausted and unsure. And the reason they were exhausted is because they came from a long way. Look what the text says. Jesus was born in Bethlehem during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king? So they were exhausted and they were wondering where and, you know, how this is all going to happen. So... These wise men, a couple things you need to understand about them. They were royal advisors. They weren't kings. They served the kings. Now, they were highly educated. They were wealthy, unlike the shepherds. The shepherds were exact opposite. They were uh, smelly and poor. Uh, but the, the wise men, man, they were, they were scientists. They were astronomers. They studied the stars. They studied math. They studied languages. They were the smartest people in the room. Um, and so they, they arrive, and, and they're still wondering what is, is going to happen, what's going to take place. And they came from eastern lands. It was a long ways away. It was probably from Babylon or Persia, which would be modern-day uh, Iraq and Iran. And uh, so here they, they come, and traveling all the way from the east, eastern land, and I know we sing, we three kings, but again, they weren't kings. It only says there were three gifts. The Bible says there were only three gifts. So there could have been ten kings or ten, ten wise men, um, but they brought three gifts. So we, it, there's some things here that oftentimes we don't know about the story until you dig in just a little bit. And how long did it take for them to get from Babylon to Jerusalem? Well, if they would have gone as a crow flies straight across the desert, it would have been about 800 miles. That's maybe from here to Chicago. Uh, if they would have went the ancient trade route, which was what they normally would have, they would have done, because going through the de desert, you wouldn't have made it. Uh, there would have been about 1,200 miles along the ancient trade route. So that would be like from here to Miami. Now, that was all on a camel. That would have taken four months and think about it. They're hot. They're sweaty. It's terrible terrain. All kinds of bandits. They were exposed. Uh, it was a long way. It wasn't like catching a plane. It wasn't like riding in an air-conditioned car. I mean, it was a difficult trip. So when they finally got there, when they pulled their caravan into Jerusalem, they were exhausted. And I'm sure they were wondering, like, you know, where is this really going to happen? Are we going to get to see this king? Was this a bad idea? Who, who thought this up? Did you have a bad dream? Maybe you had, you know, you, maybe you had too much uh, pickled herring and cream sauce. You just had a nightmare. And, and here we are. Uh, what, is this ever going to work out? Maybe we should turn back. Maybe we should quit. They were overwhelmed by this journey and whether, you know, this was actually going to pan out. So they were, they were overwhelmed. They wanted to maybe quit. So look at the cast of characters. <laughs> you know, we got some of them were uh, confused and worried. Others of them were hurt and disillusioned. Some were fearful and scared. And some were exhausted and unsure. Doesn't sound like a very Merry Christmas does it? 
And some of you here today, and I, I'm absolutely certain there's some of you today, 2,000 years later, who are feeling one or more or maybe all of these emotions. Some of you are confused about what's going on. Some of you are, are worried. Some of you are are hurt, you're disillusioned. Again, you started 2020 off with a great plan. You were just like, yes, it's going to be the greatest year. I got 2020 vision. I mean, we had all the little lines, didn't we? And then look what happens. Everything gets turned upside down. Some of you are disillusioned. Some of you are fearful and scared. You're wondering if you're going to catch COVID. You wonder if, you know, the people that you're with, maybe they're vulnerable and are they... Some of you are just so exhausted. You're just so exhausted. You've had to be flexible and, and shift on the run. And, and oh, you just, you want life to get back to normal. And isn't it amazing? This was a different time, a different era, a different culture, different people, different context, different everything than what we live with today. But the same emotions that they felt, we, f- we feel 2,000 years later. Which really makes me believe this quote that, or phrase that you've heard before. This isn't anything new, but I think it's so true. It's not what happens to you. It's how you respond to what happens to you. Because we can all create a what. And we can all one-up somebody else. They say what they're going through. Well, oh, you should listen to my story. And we can create a what has happened to me that will blow us all away and we'll just have all kinds of sympathy for you. And, and some of you, I, I'm not, men, you know, we need to share each other, those kind of things with each other. But oftentimes, that's what we get stuck on. We get obsessed with what we're going through and what we're feeling. And that's part of the problem when we start looking around and looking within instead of looking up. When we start looking up, things will start looking up. You cannot, I cannot depend on my feelings. When I start depending on my feelings, I get in trouble. Because feelings, well, actually, I'll get to that in a minute. But, you know, how you respond to things, maybe that's, maybe that's the difference between success and defeat. When you're able to take what happens to you and turn it around and, and turn it for your good. Maybe it's the difference between somebody who experiences some of the same things, but they take responsibility for it and they don't blame everybody else, but they take responsibility. Maybe it's, it's the resilience factor that really is the important thing. I love that word, resilience. You've got to have resilience in life. You've got to have resilience in marriage, in parenting, just in business, in life, because you are going to get knocked down. You are going to get knocked down because nothing good, anything good is difficult, and there's a reason for it, and it's good for us. Sometimes the very person that has rejected you, maybe God sent your way so that it would help you to be more resilient. The very thing that maybe is difficult that we want to escape is the very thing that gives us great, uh, you know, bounce back ability and helps us to be what we need to be in the moment. Perspective. Maybe it's people who have just a perspective. They can go through this and still maintain. Things are looking up. We're going to get through this. Wow. I mean, I think really what we can learn from these characters is helpful in, in helping us to find replenishment for our, our exhausted souls when we look at their story. I think we can find probably it will have less confusion and more clarity. Maybe healing from some of the hurt and disillusionment that we've had and, and more peace and less stress because we have a lot to learn from these characters. Every one of them, they wanted to give up. And so I think what the key is, if we do what they did, because every one of these characters looked up and they looked up to God. When their focus changed, their feelings changed. And so that's what I want to say to you here this morning. When your focus changes, your feelings will change. When your focus changes, your feelings will follow eventually. Maybe not right away. And as I mentioned before, feelings are real. We don't deny them, but they're not reliable. 
You can't stand on them. If you rely on your feelings, you're such a feely person, and it's all about how you feel, you get up, and your day is dictated by how you feel, you will be up one moment and down the next. You will be an emotional roller coaster. You will make life miserable for the people around you. You'll be miserable yourself because they're real, but they're not reliable. I mean, I, I'm like you. I have those days. Typically, they're Mondays. <laughs> Mondays tend to be the most difficult for, for pastors. I don't know. Even after a good Sunday, I feel like I preached well and, you know, things were happening, things were going good. I, Mondays, sometimes, I just can be down in the dumps. Connie can't fix it. I don't even know how to fix it in the moment. And uh, so I give m- myself permission just to maybe I need a little bit more rest today. Maybe I just need to pull away. And typically, uh, it's been my day off, so it is a good day for me to just kind of you know, not do really anything church-related, business-related. So, But sometimes I, I don't understand my feelings. They're real, but they're not reliable. And I have to kind of pull myself up by the bootstraps and instead of focusing on what I feel or what's happening around me and, and just to be able to say, God, I don't understand what I'm feeling. I don't understand what's going on, but you know what? I'm looking up to you. And when I begin to do that, my feelings begin to change. They're real, but they're not reliable. So let's look at all of these characters again. And we're not going to take much more time on this, but let's go back to Mary. Because everything changed for Mary when she began to focus on God's promises. We find that in her story. At first, she didn't do that. At first, she's focusing on an unplanned pregnancy. And some of you, you know what that's like. Maybe, maybe you experience that. Maybe you have a, 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 a son or daughter or, you know, that have experienced that situation. And um, you know that it, uh, it totally changes everything. The future now looks completely different when there's an unplanned pregnancy. And so Mary, yeah, she's nobody different than you would think or feel in that situation. She, she's thinking about an unplanned pregnancy. What does this mean? Um, this is a difficult position to be put in. You know, she's focusing on all the gossip now and the rumors going around. Um, she's maybe focusing on the rejection from Joseph. Joseph wants to kind of put her out. And uh, maybe she's Maybe from her parents who don't believe her. People, yeah, yeah, right, Mary. <laughs> they don't believe her. I mean, she's focusing on all the bad news. But then we find in her story that all of a sudden, Mary began to look up and she turned her focus to God and the promise that he made. Look what the text says in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. The angel says, for nothing is impossible with God. And there's a much more the angel said prior to that, but uh, he wrapped it up. The angel said, nothing is impossible. This whole situation is not impossible with God. So Mary responded. Look at Mary's response. See, this, you, we've, uh, we have read what happened to her. Now here's her response. This is the power of a response. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come that's a great verse for us believers that we, would, that we would declare everything that you have said about me is true. I may not feel it. I may not see it. I may not hear that from some of the closest people to me. But God, what you said about me, I can rely on that. I can stand on that. And so Mary had an attitudinal change when she got her eyes off the condition, off the circumstances And she began to look up. She began to look to God and to the promise that God had made her. That's when she began to see. That's when she began to believe that God had something bigger and better and greater than she could have ever imagined on her own. Everything changed for her. And not only, and and then in the rest of Luke chapter 1, she prays the most amazing prayer. It's a good read this week to read what Mary prayed. And you can see she quotes so much scripture in her prayer. So we know that Mary was a young woman of the word. She quoted God's word, the the Old Testament scriptures. She was, and that helped her was she focused on God's word so that she got to the point where she said, I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. I'm highly favored. I'm blessed. Maybe hours, maybe days, maybe weeks before she's like, oh, no, what am I going to do? I'm pregnant. 
I'm still a virgin. There's so many questions. What do you got for me, God? And now, all of a sudden, because she focused on the promise of God, now I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. That's a change in attitude, isn't it? And not only did her attitude change, but everybody she was associated with, their attitude changed too. Look at this. And her neighbors, relatives heard the Lord, had been very merciful to her, and everyone rejoiced with her. Your attitude is contagious both ways. To the good, to the bad. Mary's attitude changed. It changed everybody else's around her. Everything changed when she focused on God's promises. How about Joseph? Everything changed for Joseph when he changed his focus from his pain to God's plan. Now, he didn't understand God's plan like oftentimes we don't. And it sounded like it was going to be a difficult plan, but oftentimes that's the way it is. But when he began to focus on the, receive the plan and focus on it, look, look at the text. It says this, and we'll jump to Matthew chapter 20, or Chapter 1, verse 20, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, the angel said, do not be afraid. Here's the plan. Here's God's plan. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Take Mary as your wife. God had to send an angel to get that through to Joseph. And if he would have been rebellious and doubted that or denied that, then, you know, (laughs) a lot wouldn't have happened. But here, he took God's plan. And the angel went on to say, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So Joseph, who had been focusing on his feelings, who had been focused on maybe the shame that it was bringing to Mary, this whole situation, he was focusing on his own embarrassment. Uh, He was able to shift his focus. Maybe you're in a situation where you don't really see another way out. Can I tell you, don't look out around you. Look up. And as you look up, you'll, you'll see that your attitude will change and things will begin to change. Now, how about the shepherds? Everything changed for the shepherds too because uh, the shepherds, uh, they, things change when they begin to look up. Now, they are out in the fields washing their sheep and then all of a sudden the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior has been born today in Bethlehem. So these shepherds, they're out in the field. They see this angel light show that was brilliant, that was amazing. And uh, they were scared to death, but all of a sudden they calmed down when they heard the angel say, okay, this is, this is what's going to happen. And they totally changed their focus when they began to look up. And so then the story goes on. Uh, the angels further said, you're going to recognize this Savior, by this sign, you'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. He goes on to say that suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others. Now it's just not one angel that surrounded him. Now, picture a vast host of others. That must have been so amazing. Uh, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. I'll keep going here. When the angels had returned to heaven, they said, all right, we're out of here. The shepherds said, let's go. Come on, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried. They're not just chillaxing in the hillside. They're hurrying to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was a baby lying in the manger. Then something incredible happens. Now they leave their their fear how scared they were, and now they become courageous witnesses. Maybe the first witnesses as they, you know, after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened. Do you remember when you were like that? After you got saved, you told everyone what God was doing in your heart. You invited people to church. Some of you, it's been a long time since you invited somebody to church. Um, Remember when you just, you didn't care what people thought? You just told everybody what God was doing in your own heart. I love to see that in, in this, the shepherds. They were fearful. They were afraid. They lacked courage. All of a sudden, they changed what they were looking at. And they, they took God's plan, and they focused on Him, and God gave them great courage and boldness. How about the wise men? 
They were exhausted and worried, you remember? Exhausted and, and uncertain. Um, but these wise men, everything changed when they met Jesus in person. When they met Jesus in person. Look what it says here, Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And so the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. If they had had their heads down, looking down, they might have missed this whole event. But they were guided by the star. They were looking up, following the star. How lost do we get in life when we got our head down? We're buried in our issues or problems. We don't see, or all we see is the things happening around us. I was counseling a, a woman a long time ago. I can't remember who it was, but uh, she came into my office and Man, she was in the middle of a lot of emotional stuff going on. Uh, you know, I kind of doubted my ability to kind of help her through this other than the spiritual aspect of it. And we met for a number of weeks in a row. Um, and after about four or five weeks, all of a sudden she, she walks in and, you know, my office, I got a bunch of deer mounts and pheasant and, you know, there's other things crawling around that maybe you haven't even seen yet. But uh, all of a sudden she sits down in the chair and she looks up she have these always been here? <laughs> she finally noticed them. Because before that, all she could see and all she could feel was what she was dealing with. And it took about four or five weeks of helping her to just lift her head up, begin to look to God for strength. That All of a sudden, now she was more aware of what was happening around her. The wise men, they were looking up. They were following the star. And uh, when they finally saw the star, they were filled with joy. There was Maybe they were convinced, yes, this is going to happen. It's going to take place. And uh, all the tiredness, all the fatigue, all the, you know, the difficult journey, all those things now just, you know, went by the wayside when they changed their focus and they met him personally. And that's what I want to close with this morning. How do you know when you've met Jesus personally? I, I, don't mean, I don't mean just know about him. I mean you have a relationship with him. How do you, how do you know that? I, I think maybe by the, you know, s- some of the things that the shepherds or the wise men did. The wise men, what did they do? They, humbled, they were humbled by his presence. They, they met Jesus personally, and they were humbled by his presence. Have you had that sense in your life when you approach the throne of grace, where you're humbled, where you just, you're willing to just let your ego go, you're, you're willing to just get lost in a, and abandon in his presence? Many of you know my story. I grew up Catholic. And I remember going to Mass. We were pretty committed Catholics. But, you know, we'd go and there, we, we did some music, but it, I didn't know what worship was. That I had never really heard that term, even though we sang songs. And I'll be honest, I stood there like a stick. You know, maybe my mouth would go, but I, I, I stood there like a stick. There was, there was no expression. And so... Once I got born again, we started going to an Assembly God church, and wow, were our, our eyes open to worship. People's hands lifted, and music that, I mean, they had a drummer, they had a band. It was like, wow, this, uh, do people do this? These contemporary songs about God, I, I never knew that existed. And all of a sudden, my eyes were opened, and my spirit was beginning, that, that, that little baby Christian was beginning to, to grow. And I'll never forget watching Dick Mater worship. Six foot eight, Dick Mater. Big man. All of a sudden, I would, I want, I, it made such an impression on me. He, both of his arms went up like flagpoles as he worshiped God. That made an impression on this young teenager. I'd never seen a man worship God like that. It made an impression on me. And even when I worship today, when I shoot my hands up in the air, and sometimes I don't feel like it, but 
sacrifice of praise. God, I'm not going to let my feelings dictate my praise. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to lift up my hands and surrender to you, God. Even when I do that to this day, Dick Mater comes to my mind. That's the kind of impression he made on this young teenage boy, this new believer. And I encourage you to grow in your own expression of worship. I'd love to see in 2021, I, I, I'm not saying there's a right way to worship and a wrong way to worship. But some of us are like sticks. Are you willing to humble yourself? Because when you worship Him, however you feel comfortable, well, not, I shouldn't say how you feel comfortable. What an expression of your love and gratefulness to the, to the Lord because that's that's the second thing that the, the wise men, this was their expression. But the thing is, is when you worship God, guess what? You're making an impression on your sons and your daughters. But here, on the other side of that, your lack of expression is making an impression on your sons and your daughters. I'd love to see our church grow in freedom own expression, just to not be so self-conscious, not to ever think about what somebody's thinking. Sometimes our lack of worship is because we've messed up, we've sinned, how, I just feel so unworthy. I, my wife knows that I yelled at her on the way to church, how can I lift my hand? I know we all have those thoughts and feelings going on, but that's the opportunity to humble yourself before the Lord and express your love and gratitude. You know, wouldn't it be terrible, honey, if I if I just, my expression to, of my love to you was, I love you, I love you. Or maybe I just thought it in my head and I didn't say those words. Would that be very convincing of my love and gratitude towards you? No. But when I'm willing to get down on one knee and say, would you marry me? And I want you to know I love you. I love you with all of my heart. And I'm going to love you forever. I'll be committed to this relationship. What's it, it? Isn't that a difference? And so sometimes our worship can be such a lack of expressing love and grief. It's that simple, folks. How much do you love Him? How grateful are you to Him? That's what worship is. And then the last thing they did was this. They offered him everything. They brought their treasure. And it would be great for us to be able to give God our best. The best of our time. The best of our treasure. The best of our, our lives. I mean, imagine a room full of people who give their best. They, they're trying their best to live right. They're serving the best that they can. They're loving that's the kind of church I want to be a part of. That's the kind of marriage I want to be a part of, where we're giving our best. That's the kind of family when we're giving our best, not just the leftovers, but our very best. So I leave you with this question here this morning. What do you feel like you're ready to give up on? What is it that you've been contemplating giving up on? Some of you are thinking about giving up on a relationship. Maybe a marriage. It's been so tough. You're so unheard. There's so many unmet expectations. You don't really know the health of the long-term situation. You, you, you kind of thought about giving up. Some of you are thinking about giving up on a career. You've lost your passion. It's just not working for you anymore. Some of you are want to give up some kids. You, you've tried all you can, and there's, they still just do their own thing. Some of you want to give up on some parents. You've been praying for a, a prodigal parent. You've been praying for a stepmom or a stepdad. It's been so hard. It's been so difficult. You're just ready to forget it. Let them live their own life. Some of you have been contemplating giving up on yourself. You've thought about taking your own life. It'd be hard to admit it in a group like this, and maybe we wouldn't even make that available for you to do, but even if you were meeting with somebody, it would be hard to admit. I've had those thoughts of taking my own life out. Can I say to you, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't, don't, don't give up. Look up. And if you're tuning in right now,
right now. We've got a number that's scrolling across that screen. We've got people that are ready right now by the phone. If you call that number right now, they will talk with you. They will pray for you. I plead with you, don't give up. This is a stressful time of the year, maybe the most. It's not time to give up. It's time to look up. And as you do, your redemption draws nigh. God is there to meet you. He's waiting for you. Just make that call. Somebody will pray with you and believe with you. And if you're part of this church or congregation, you're visiting here today and you feel like you have no place to go and you're ready to give up, please don't give up. Somebody will meet with you. Somebody will talk with you. You know why? Because we've all been there at varying degrees and times in our lives. If I could have people come up here who have dealt with suicidal thoughts and how they've had to overcome that and how they're on the other side of that and some people that maybe aren't quite on the other side of that you'd be shocked, you'd be amazed and you're not alone you're not, I know you feel alone but you're not and uh, so I encourage you, don't, don't give up look up I'm so glad that God didn't give up on me and that I didn't give up on God. Would you stand with me today? I know I need to let you go, but uh, I just want to take a moment to pray with you. And maybe here today, and you've you've known about Jesus, you know about God, you even kind of know some things about the Christmas story. You maybe learned a couple new things here today, but you know that you need more. And that more is a relationship, not a religion. It's a relation. It's not joining a church. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. You may not know what that means, but you don't have to understand it all. You can take that first step with it simply to give your heart to God right now. Ask Him for forgiveness. He's already forgiven you through Jesus Christ. You just have to acknowledge it, and He'll forgive you of your sins can begin that relationship and you can be that new baby believer like I was back in 1972 and everything was new and I was just beginning to experience a relationship with Jesus. If that's you here today or maybe you're coming back to Jesus, you've been away, just pray this prayer from your heart. I'll lead you in this prayer. We don't have to all say it together. Just say it from your heart. It's something like this. Dear God, I am so sorry. I, I, I know I'm a sinner. I've done my own thing. I, I've done wrong. And I know that I'm on a dead-end road. Maybe some things are going good for me, but spiritually I know I, I just don't even really have a, a relationship with you and I, I know I need that God and I want to give you my life I want to surrender my life to you I ask forgiveness of my sins forgive me God and help me to be the man, the woman that you made me to be and I thank you for saving me today for making me born again in Jesus name Amen